Dr. Jalo, welcome to the Listserv International Neurosurgery Lecture Series. It's a real honor and privilege to get a lecture from you on Chiari malformations and syringomyelia. I'm very grateful to you as you have supported the Listserv projects almost from its inception, and uh, I'm greatly looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Naren. Um it's an honor for me to give this presentation, especially uh, at this uh, in this day uh, and age of uh, of, uh, of the internet and uh, access uh, to to lectures, rather than having to sit in a lecture hall. I think what I'm going to talk about today is really curing malformation and syringomyelia. Um, again, you know, my disclaimer is that there is a lot of controversy on this topic, but hopefully. Uh, uh, Hopefully, you know, that we can discuss it today and uh, have a uh, consensus opinion of how we should do it. I think what I want to start off with is just a presentation, simple. Eight-year-old girl presented with, um, with progressive scoliosis and headaches that were precipitated by activity uh, and exercise. That's all the classic headaches in the uh, posterior occipital region. Otherwise, there are no significant concerns. Uh, her orthopedic surgeon obtained an MRI and then uh, recommended that she see a neurosurgeon. And here's the MRI of the brain, uh, as well as the cervical spine. You can see the Chiari malformation. Uh, there's some kinking in the medulla and a large syrinx uh, uh, on this girl that starts from essentially about C1, C2 and, and uh, uh, ends in the thoracic spine. On exam, she was very, there's really no appreciable deficits, and her scoliosis was only uh, graded at uh, 30, 29, 30 degrees by her orthopedist. So the problem is, you know, the QR malformation with sternomyelia. Her tonsils were about eight to nine millimeters below the frame and magnum, obstructing the uh, CSF flow pathways that led to the creation of her sternomyelia slash hydromyelia. And, uh, you know, the theory is this contributed to her uh, scoliosis. So when we talk about Chiari malformations, I think, you know, it's not just one disease entity. I think it's a group of abnormalities that involve the contents of the uh, craniocervical junction with the herniation of the hindbrain through the frame and magnum serving as a continuum. And it can be divided into, you know, several uh, entities. And just for historical purposes, I'm just going to leave this slide up and, uh, you know, just to understand why it's been called an Arnold Chiari malformation, Chiari malformation. What we do know is that it was probably recognized uh, before these two uh, anatomists uh, uh, made the diagnosis. Um, and then, you know, there are, you know, many, three different types. Uh, there's been in the literature of a Chiari zero, uh, where the posterior fossa uh, is normal on CT and MR. However, the symptoms are consistent with uh, the classic Chiari 1 malformation. And the talk really is going to focus on Chiari 1s and not the other two types. So, really, you know, when we talk about the Chiari malformation, uh, you know, there's the caudal descent of the cere cerebellar tonsils into the upper cervical cord. Um, and there, it's unusual. The majority of patients, uh, children or uh, adults, will have the tonsils descend but stay above C2. On rare occasions, they can go down uh, uh, below C2, C3. I think, you know, that's more typical of the Chiari 2, where the tonsils are uh, well into the uh, lower cervical spinal cord. And there's really no association with an open spinal dysraphism. Hydrocephalus, if present, is uncommon, as, uh, as it is more typical for the QRE2 malformation. However, these are children that can have some other associated anomalies of skull-based basal invagination, assimilation of uh, the occiput with C1, or even, uh, you know, cervical hypoplasia. Looking at it, the vermis, the fourth ventricle, and the lower brainstem all are normal. The tonsils are below the frame of magnum, and fibrous adhesions may develop, uh, which block the outflow of the uh, fourth ventricle. And most commonly, you will see some constricting band of dura that is present at the frame and magnum. And there may um, be 
on some small percentage of children, they may have anterior disease, whether it be compression of the odontoid process or even the basilar invagination, which may make this a little more uh, complex. Syringomyelia can be seen in up to uh, three quarters of the children uh, on scans, and that typically it's seen more when uh, there's an associated scoliosis in these patients. This is an autopsy uh, specimen. Uh, showing the tonsils can be asymmetrical. Uh, here, the tonsils uh, on the right have descended much more than the uh, uh, the one on the on the left. So it doesn't typically they do not have to have descend to the same level. And I've seen it where one tonsil has been normal above the frame and magnum, and then one tonsil well below uh, the frame and magnum. And again, the natural history, unknown. Um, you know, there is some evidence that the tonsils can ascend as the, as the children get older. Uh, but again, this is, there's been no uh, particular study that I'm aware of. And really, the QRE1 is a radiographic diagnosis, uh, and it could be clinically insignificant in the absence of symptoms and, sur and or syringomyelia. Looking at the pathogenesis, and I don't think we have time, is the cervical being pushed down from hydrocephalus? Is it being pulled down uh, to explain the mild meningocele tethered cord association, or is it a craniospinal pressure dissociation, or is it uh, lead to maldevelopment, CSF loss um, uh, leads to maldevelopment of the brain stem cervelum and uh, the ventricle? This is, you know, this is definitely seen in the, uh, the MOMS trial for the in utero repair of the mild meningocele. Now, the symptoms, I look at them as, you know, the classic symptoms is really headache, neck pain, shoulder pain. It's seen up to two-thirds of the children. And this pain is, uh, the headaches are typically induced by activity, exercise, or valsalva. You know, I've seen the children complain that, you know, they're weightlifting, they're uh, running, they're coughing, or they're even having bowel movements, and these headaches are persistent. In the younger children, infants, it can present with feeding problems, recurrent aspirations, or even central apnea in the very young infants. Uh, looking at it, I, you know, I break it down to frame it into really three distinct syndromes, compression at the frame and magnum and seen up to a quarter. The central cord syndrome from the stringomyelia um, can lead to dissociated sensory loss or some lower motor neuron. And the cerebellar symptoms, uh, syndrome, which is the ataxia, the nystagmus, uh, or sometimes uh, dysarthria in some of these uh, children. I think, you know, what, what I've been told, what, you know, some, what's the classic teaching is that the Chiari malformation is the great imitator of any disease. So really it's the imaging that is key. And, you know, for me, it's the MRI looking at the descent of the tonsils or the cerebellar um, hindbrain below the frame and magnum. Um, and you have to make the distinction, you know, between ectopia, or uh, really the Chiari malformation and their appearance. And in some children, I, I like to obtain a Cineflow MRI. Um, again, I try to reserve CT and x-rays really just to look at if there's other abnormalities such as the basilar invagination, the assimilation, or you know, if there's an agenesis or if we're looking at scoliosis. Uh, for me, the gold standard is the uh, MRI scan as seen here. Looking at the you know the frame the line the frame magnum with the clivus and looking at the tonsils and their descent and then again this kinking of the uh, the medullary uh, junction or upper cervical cord and you can see on the axial that at the level of frame and magnum spinal cord the medulla spinal cord and you can see that the tonsils are, are filling up the frame magnum where CSF uh, should be and even on coronal images and then the associated syringomyelia that may be associated with this uh, malformation. Uh, so here's the controversy. What, do, what does someone do? You know, if, is it a posterior cranial cervical cranial vertebral decompression with or without an expansile dur dur duroplasty? Uh, what do we do about the single myelia? Do we do do we stent it, train it, or or uh, observe it? And uh, should we? Do, what happens in the setting of hydrocephalus and the question of a CSF diversion for that? This is an algorithm that I borrowed from the, the textbooks 
um, from, and I have to credit uh, uh, Dr. Jerry Oakes about this in uh, one of the pediatric neurosurgery textbooks, look at it as symptomatic Chiari 1 malformation. Exclude hydrocephalus in the ventral compression. Is there a syrinx? If there's a syrinx, uh, go on to a Chiari decompression. If there's no syrinx, uh, looking, look at the descent. You know, is it less than three millimeters? I observe. If it's three to five, I really do exercise cl clinical judgment. And if it's greater than five, um, uh, you know, millimeters, and they're symptomatic again, uh, that goes on to a Chiari decompression uh, for the no no syrinx uh, population. So then comes the variations in surgery. You know, it's like, do you do a foot pressure phosphocraniectomy with or without C1 laminectomy? There's been controversy. How wide is it? And if you do the posterior fossil craniectomy, do you do a dura? Do you do do you open the dura or not? If you open the dura, do you shrink the tonsils or not? If you open the dura, do you do it? Um, uh, you know, do you add a duraplasty where some will also just leave it open? Um, in terms of dura plastic materials, is it autologous versus an allograft? And then do you add for the syrinx? Do you add the stent? The syringo subarachnoid or syringo, uh, some other cavity uh, uh, shut at the same time. Again, I think that's the variations and that's where the controversy exists. And I think really the de technical details of the operation are very much dependent upon the surgeon's preference. Evidence exists to support any of the favorable results and outcomes with each of these surgical permutations. And there is still no consensus in which technique is the best. I think each surgeon ha w must understand the limitations of their, pr their procedure as well as its success rates and the, uh, the complications that, that is uh, associated with it. And I think, you know, here's the question. So what about the patient that has an asymptomatic syrinx? What do you do about that? Um, and, you know, I think, again, this is a controversial topic. Um, you know, if you look at that, you know, we looked at the, my algorithm that I followed with the symptomatic uh, syrinx. Well, if you look at it, if, he's as if there's asymptomatic and there is a syrinx, um, I would still most likely, and here's an example of a six-year-old boy just presented with scoliosis, similar to that eight-year-old girl, but no headaches, no Valsalva headaches. You can see the curie malformation. You can see the syrinx there. Um, and this one ascended, almost descended all the way down to T10, T11, and you know the argument is, what do you do? And I would advocate for surgery. Although you know, is this child symptomatic or not? He has no neurological findings, no headaches. He just has a scoliosis, and he was found to have this QRI malformation. And you know, there are some papers that look at this. You know, some of these papers that looked at the natural natural history of untreated syringomyelia in the pediatric uh, patients. They looked at 17 children with a Chiari 1 and syringomyelia, and that, you know, about only 12 to 15 percent worsened, um, demonstrated radiographic worsening, uh, but only half had clinical worsening. And I think that's the controversy. And this is some of the, you know, some of the surveys that were done, um, again, by Paul Steinbach, looking at, it was an international survey, he looked at the management of Chiari 1 with syringomyelia. If the child was asymptomatic without syringomyelia, the majority of surgeons recommended follow-up. You take that and add a syrinx that measured eight millimeters width wide and no other details that shifted, 75% recommended the intervention with a cervical medullary or suboccipital uh, decompression. So again, you know, asymptomatic, no syrinx, watch. If there's a syrinx, I think that is a symptom um, and I would advocate for surgery. And then, you know, in terms of, this is a more recent survey of the, at the ASPM, the American uh, Pediatric Neurosurgeons, looking at, you know, looking at questions asymptomatic with, a, with the tonsils about a centimeter down and a large uh, syrinx, you can see that really only 15% advocated were conservative. Um, the other 80% plus advocated for surgery. And if you added headaches to that syrinx, uh, it went up to about 90, 95% with only 4% uh, recommending uh, conservative follow-up for that group. 
I, I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can get that. If you added, um, if you added neurological def deficits, then it was close to 100% uh, advocating surgery. So, I mean, these are all good surveys of uh, practices. Just goes about to tell you that there are many ways to treat these. So, really, I think I think you know, I I tend to I tend I'm very similar to those. To the two surveys that I showed you uh, in terms of the, the management, and I tend to, if I do a duroplasty, I use an allograft, but I can't say that my technique is any better than someone that uh, does an autograft. And we didn't even discuss whether or not you should open the dura or not, because again, you can see from those previous surveys that some would only do uh, the the bony decompression and not even do a duroplasty. And I think you know we just don't have enough time to get into. Uh, that discussion, but I think we can say in the asymptomatic one, uh, patient with a QRE1 malformation and uh, and uh, con concurrent syndromyelia, observation with serial physical and radio radiographic examination may be reasonable, but the consensus of pediatric neuro neurosurgeons um, and two separate surveys would recommend surgery uh, or some surgical intervention. And looking at just, you know, the, again, just a paper that was recently published in, uh, in World Neurosurgery, looking at 1,200 patients, uh, three, two thirds of which had a syrinx, you can see that, uh, you know, they did bony decompression, duroplasty. You can see the numbers, a very large uh, number looking at the bony decompression, duroplasty, or duroplasty in tonsillar coagulation. You can see that the p patients that underwent a duroplasty with or without tonsillar, tonsillar coagulation actually were more likely to improve than the group that just went uh, with the bony decompression. And I think that's the largest uh, series. Uh, um, it was, you know, again, reviewing the, the literature that is that was available for Chiari malformations. And then the last question I have, you know, that I, that needs to be answered is, so you've treated the, ch the, the child with a Chiari 1 malformation in, in the string myelia, now, how long do you have to follow them? And there, you know, if you look at this paper <clears throat> again from the Mayo Clinic, you know, they they said that about you know the the clinical results, the imaging can take up to two years. Uh, looking at the neuroimaging, um, at three to six months, 86% of the surfaces will improve. By one year, about 91%, and it may take up to two years to see some radiographic improvement in the surfaces. And here's some of the images from that paper. Uh, here's the preoperative uh, scan. You can see at one week it's already smaller, three months it's even smaller, and that it hasn't recurred at one, three, or five years. So, you know, with the progression. But with that said, you know, I can tell you, I thought I believed in this paper, but here's a patient of mine that represented seven years later following a cervical medullary decompression, and he underwent a re-exploration, was found to have both soft tissue and arachnoid scarring that resulted in a, a new obstruction in the CSF, and that this syrinx was not, you know, went away uh, immediately, you know, within the year after surgery, but recurred seven years after his operation. And I have two such patients that recurred in the delayed fashion. So I think, you know, the question is, you know, I don't think we know when to reoperate on these, and that you know that re there are several papers looking at the reoperation as well as the revision surgery for curing malformation. So I think you know we can say that the with inadequate decompression, and I'm not telling you you know bone or bone with uh, duroplasty, um, there should be resolution uh, within one year, and that recurrence of radiographic or clinical evidence. Is, is known to happen and necessitate re repeat operation, and that the risk factors for recurrence include young age, insufficient decompression, complex bony anatomy, or you know some associated syndrome, and that there's really no literature that exists to indicate how long is long enough uh, for to follow these patients. Uh, so Naren, again, you know, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to present my thoughts on uh, the Chiari malformation. Thank you very much, uh, George. It's, uh, you know, you covered the very important points uh, uh, very clearly. Um, and 
as you said in your presentation, the practice is so variable across the board. Um, it's uh, it's good to know how uh, someone as you, with a very established and uh, respectable, uh, highly regarded practice, um, uh, undertake management of these patients. If I may, first of all, ask you questions on your presentation and then some general discussion regarding Chiari, if that would be okay with you. Sure, and absolutely. Happy to.